Well, three years have gone by since Narendra Modi led the NDA to a thumping victory to form India's first majority government in three decades. Has he delivered on the promise of Acheden? If you ask the last street, the answer will be a unanimous yes. But what about the rest of the country and the economy? Good evening and welcome to the CNBC TV 18 special. I'm Shireen Bhan. Joining us over the next 60 minutes to discuss the impact of the government's actions and implications for India are some of the most influential voices in the country. Ram Agarwal of Motilal Oswal, Nilesh Shah of Invision Capital, Bala Bhansali of Enam Securities, the President of FIKI, Pankaj Patel, and CII's President Designate Rakesh Bharti Mittal. Also joining us from Washington is Shailesh Kumar of the EuroAsia Group. Gentlemen, thanks very much for joining us here on the CNBC TV 18 special. But before we go any further, let me take you through the performance and let's start with the markets and how they've behaved in the last three years. What a resounding uh, vote of confident as it has been as far as the markets are concerned. That's where we were, 24,717 on the 26th of May in 2014. And here we are today, 31,028 on the 26th of May in 2017. India and the Indian equity markets have clearly been on a tear. The Nifty is up 27%, the Sensex is up 24%, the Nifty Bank up 53%, and look at this one, the Mid-Cap Index is up a whopping 70%. This is the performance for the market since the 26th of May in 2014, so over the last three years, this is what we've seen, but that is a staggering number uh, for the Mid-Cap Index. FIIs, they've bought worth 17,514 crore rupees in the cash market. Domestic institutions, that's the interesting side of this story, they've bought worth 1,000 1,113,000 crore rupees in the cash market. So almost $25 billion worth of money have come in from the domestic institutions uh, in the last two years alone if you look at the rush of liquidity that's come in from the domestic institutions. But let's talk about uh, uh, what we should make of the market picture uh, over the last three years and what this tells us about the road ahead. Uh, Nilesh Shah, let me bring you in on this conversation. Uh, you know, we can argue and quibble about valuations, whether they're stretched, whether earnings are going to be on par and actually improve, uh, as is the expectation in FI18. But look at the numbers on our screen. Those numbers tell a story about the kind of confidence that the market seems to have in this government. Absolutely. I think uh, this is the best vote the markets could have given uh, on the Modi government. I think clearly over the last three years, the narrative has changed significantly. Uh, clearly three years back, India was perceived to be a fragile place, an economy which was still not able to kind of really stand up. Uh, and from there, we have moved to a situation where we are now perceived to be amongst the most stable and strong economies. Uh, and I think apart from, of course, global liquidity, which has come in, uh, I think the biggest positive is the domestic liquidity, which has really come in. So three years back, the perception was or the focus was how will our markets basically be able to stand up against any FI selling or will there be global liquidity, which will come in? Versus that, I think this time around in the last three years, the surge of domestic liquidity, I think, has act as a pretty strong force against any kind of global volatility. And I think that really is the biggest positive and the best possible signal which the markets could have given to the Modi government. You know, just to pick up on that last point that you made, Nilesh, and I was having a conversation with Rakesh Junjanwala just a few days ago, and he told me very categorically that he believes that the rush of domestic money will continue. In fact, he quoted a Morgan Stanley report which seems to suggest that we could see to the tune of over 400 to between 400 to 800 billion dollars of domestic money come into the Indian market, and that will completely change the complexion of Indian equities. Uh, do you believe that that kind of confidence and that kind of flow uh, is expected? Absolutely. The biggest outcome, I think, of the last three years is basically the trend towards final, fi financialization of domestic savings. So clearly earlier the preference and the priority was to kind of be invested into hard assets like gold and real estate. And I think versus that, we've clearly sh seen a shift because of various steps, various measures, You've clearly seen a big shift towards financialization of savings where equities and fixed income have become clearly the preferred asset class. 
and we've probably just touched the tip of the iceberg. But given that India basically is a savings-led economy, and we're now going to mm. see this transition from a savings-led economy to an investment-led economy. And I think this is a trend which is going to be very structural in nature. This is not a trend which is going to be very short-lived. It's going to be a trend which perhaps is going to last not just for the next several years, but maybe for the next several decades. And I think that is mm. the most significant takeaway of the Modi government as far as financial markets go. Ramdi Agarwal, let me bring you in this, uh, into this conversation. Nilesh there talking about the performance of the market and how that has been such a big vote of confidence for the Modi government's performance. What are you betting on, Ramdeo, given the fact that we've already seen this massive run-up uh, in our markets? We're still awaiting a return and on the earnings front for FI18. Uh, we're still awaiting a pickup in the investment cycle, specifically as far as private capex is concerned. What are you betting on, Ramdeo? What is giving the market this kind of confidence? <clears throat> See, one is the market confidence, second is our confidence. So, uh, we have been bullish for a uh, very long time, Al almost uh, always I have been optimistic about the markets and all, but uh, last three years is, uh, has been very extraordinary in the sense that uh, actually index, uh, indices don't reveal what has actually happened in last three years. I mean, indices show yeah. about 24-25%, but I remember uh, uh, I had launched a multi-cap fund in uh, May of 14, so that's about coinciding the same date. We are up 250%, I mean, 10 rupees have become 25 rupees. So uh, clearly this 24% index movement is uh, hiding a lot yeah. of what has happened in the market actually. And that has happened because a uh, lot of large cap companies like uh, Reliance and uh, uh, Infosys and so some of these large hmm. uh, IT sectors and all, they have remained uh, literally flat for uh, or flat or negative for in this two years. But uh, rest of the uh, hmm. market has moved uh, really, I mean, it's a, it's a bull market for last three years. And uh, the whole thing is started after this uh, Goa uh, summit or something like that where uh, Mr. Modi was nominated. Yeah. And that was in October, uh, I think September, October of 2013. And since then, market yes. has started been rallying. And that time, market was about 20,000. And uh, then, by mm. the time he got elected and uh, he was sworn in, it was 24,000. So, clearly, uh, market yes. has moved just about 50%. But real, uh, what has happened in underlying market is more like, uh, I would say, almost 80 to 90% or 100%. So, I think there's a complete mm. change in the mood. I mean, actually, earnings have not come. Uh, if you look at the uh, mm. Sensex or uh, Nifty earnings, uh, aggregate earnings are same. Yeah. What has changed is the mood of optimism. I mean, it was a completely pessimistic mm. mood at that point of time. And that has given way yeah. to the very optimistic mood right now. In fact, it is the optimism which I see in the market today is uh, kind of uh, absolutely uh, uh, unbelievable in the sense that I was always optimistic. And, but then, are you are you are you saying that we're maybe bordering on irrational exuberance at this point in time, Ramdeo? Uh, I don't know about that, but uh, only looking back you can say about those kind of things. But uh, right now it's a uh, uh, I mean very very strong. I mean it, it's just defying all okay, kinds of so logic. Yeah. It's defying all kinds of logic. That's the word in from both Nilesha as well as Ramdeo uh, when we talk about the markets. Let me try and extract a number from you, Ramdeo. Where do you see the Sensex or the Nifty closing by the end of the year, given the mood of the market? I mean, it, it can be anything. Actually, we are wrong, so much wrong between uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. This is absolutely useless. Uh, I mean, I, I won't even try where exactly the markets are going to end. You won't even hazard a guess. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I always wanted 15, 20% higher. So uh, on that basis, I mean, this 30,000, 31,000 can go to 35, 37,000. But every single person will be wrong on, uh, you know, where the index is going to end. It can, it can end uh, okay. significantly higher or it may remain, stay here only. So that, but as I said, index is not telling the true story. What has happened is much bigger or what is happening is much bigger. Look at it today, HPCL, right. one day it, it moved by 12%. Hmm. So those are the kind of moves we are seeing, very aggressive moves in the stocks which are doing well. Hmm.
All right, uh, Bala Bansali also with us. Mr. Bansali, thanks very much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. As I pointed out, the mood of the market uh, clearly very, very buoyant, very confident at this point in time. Ram, they are not willing to hazard a guess on where the markets could be headed. But let me ask you, Mr. Bansali, in your experience, given the rush of liquidity that we're seeing and specifically uh, the domestic liquidity, sir, what do you make of it and what do you believe that the market is most confident about or betting most on? Well, uh, I think uh, India is headed for some extraordinary period ahead and uh, market man is uh, sensing it. Uh, short term moves are, you know, difficult to build a you know, trend on. But uh, if you ask me that, you know, what the market will be 10, 15 years out, I think it will be three, four times mm. from what it is. So that I can see more clearly than what I can say about uh, one year. Uh, India okay. is in for absolutely structural changes. And they, the people mm. can't even fathom, like in 91, we couldn't fathom that, you know, companies like Infosys will come and change the whole uh, uh, scene. Uh, so those kind of changes are happening just now. But what, what, would you, what would be the biggest structural change that you're betting on? I mean, the most immediate structural change is the goods and services tax, which rolls out on the 1st of July. And there will be uh, glitches, there will be teething troubles, etc. Uh, that, of course, is a given. But uh, one does expect that to be a pretty transformative change. Besides the GST, what are the other big structural changes that you're betting on, Mr. Bansali? So I see several of them. As a matter of fact, as the society becomes dominated by millennials, they look at reality in a very different manner. They will be born in a very facilitated and technology-driven, and India is leapfrogging in with technology and mobile and so on. At the same time, when we have digital revolution, and then you have GST, what it will do to the government revenue, what it will do to interest rate, what mm. it will do to currency, as you know, technology makes education more available, what it will do to the talent capability of our country, I think those things are just going to be absolutely amazing. So they will be unpredictable in the sense that we could not predict in the 70s that English language and engineering will create IT capability for India. Mm. So I think even if we don't seem to be so well poised for manufacturing, but the sheer capability and domestic markets will create opportunities that we can't even imagine today. Since uh, because okay. of our democracy, because of our inclusiveness, because of the receptivity that India has around the world, all these will combine as fortuitous factors, creating a great, prosperous India. Okay, uh, so what of confidence they're coming in from Mr. Bansali. But let me also bring in Pankaj Patel as well as Raj. Bharti Mittal. Uh, gentlemen, uh, uh, you know, people who track the markets very, very closely, giving a resounding thumbs up to the performance of the government. Mr. Patel, let me start by asking you, sir, what would you regard as being the key milestones that this government has been able to achieve? I'll get to the macro indicators in just a bit, where we are again seeing a, a, a fair amount of stability. But to your mind, from an industry point of view and an industry perspective, what have been the most key milestones? There are basically, uh, first is this government has moved into a policy driven governance. The result is very evident that there is more better transparency, uh, there is a level playing field for the industry, you can, on a marriage you can always win, there is a less corruption, corruption practices and also there is a, in the process what has happened is that they brought in this new uh, digital payment system the other card based mm. system which is basically reducing leakages, the subsidies are getting reduced, fiscal deficit coming down, all these are very positive indicators for, for building confidence. What is most important is this government uh, push in the infrastructure. Now we see clearly that 70% mm. of villages are ready for electrification, maybe not charged but will be charged very soon and they are now saying that yeah. by end of next year we should be seeing every village connected. All these will increase the rural income and rural uh, visibility. Now India, India's economic growth cannot happen if we don't see the rural economy growing. So we see clearly with that demand picking up, we see clearly that because of demonetization, more money come in the bank, coming more into the mutual mm. fund. Today the market is driven by Indian mutual fund and not actually foreign fund. Yeah. All these are very clearly mm. indication of changes which is happening, which will definitely create a better invest, uh, investment client, more demand. As the world economy now are starting looking better, I think exports should also look up. And with that all, we will see Indian economy growing in the next two years very well.
Okay, so uh, uh, industry feeling confident about the road ahead. Mr. Rakesh Bharti Mittal, would you concur with what we've just heard there from Pankaj Patel that now uh, the anticipation is that there will be a revival even as far as demand is concerned, there will be a revival of private investment as well, which so far has been the laggard, sir. Um, absolutely, uh, Shireen. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, in the last... Uh, um, almost two years, uh, the consumption has been uh, more on the negative side, and hence we, we saw uh, 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 the, the economy not moving the way it should have. Uh, but given the public spending on, uh, in the, in the uh, infrastructure sector, cement steel is moving, good monsoons, uh, good uh, 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 crop, uh, we are also expecting, expecting a bumper, uh, I mean expected a wheat, uh, bumper wheat crop. I believe that the consumption will uh, start moving up and that will have very positive gains uh, for, for multifarious uh, sectors in the economy. But let me also uh, say here, you know, the, the pace of reforms have been truly amazing. I mean, the way GST uh, consensus was reached and not only that, all the state governments were brought, brought on board, abolishing of FIPB yeah. and, and uh, we are uh, receiving large number of FDIs. Uh, so that is, on, uh, that is one thing which, which I think has been delivered very well. The other uh, factor mm. which I want to say is more uh, the Prime Minister's vision of, you know, putting uh, everything into a mission mode. You know, be it a Swachh Bharat mission, be it uh, a focus on the girl child, beti bachao, beti padhao, um, talking yeah. about farmers, crop insurance. So I think these are, these are some very bold initiatives taken by the Prime Minister. Mm. And, and I think uh, we are clearly looking at 1st July GST kicking in. And, uh, and I can tell you yeah. that the industry is ready. Uh, of course, the small and medium enterprises uh, are feeling a little bit uh, uh, wary, but, but I can tell you, you know, whenever there mm. is a major change and a major reform, there are glitches and there are hiccups. But I think all of us will overcome okay. that and, and that's going to be extremely positive for the country. Okay, uh, we are all awaiting the rollout of the goods and services tax just about a month uh, for that 1st of July timeline. But Ramdeo Agarwal, Nilesh and Mr. Bansali, let me pick up on the points that we b heard just now from Pankaj Patel as well as Rakesh Bharti Mittal. Ramdeo, let me start by asking you, is India today enjoying a governance premium? You know, this business of uh, there being a very clear path towards reforms, there being a decisive mandate at the center, the fact that you've got more states now under uh, the dispensation of the BJP, uh, uh, political consensus on issues like the GST, etc. Is India today enjoying a governance premium? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, uh, three years back, uh, policy paralysis and uh, uh, political, uh, you know, uh, capital of the ruling party was so little. And right now, uh, that's what exactly is the at the highest level, uh, and that's what the probably market is reflecting. Can this political capital or the political uh, consolidation which they have seen at the center, at the states, at the corporates, whatever, uh, can it be converted into economic revolution? And uh, obviously the hope is that uh, this government has that ambition and uh, the cohesion to execute. So over a period of time, it will happen. And uh, whether it happens or not, only time will tell. But that's the, uh, that's the biggest opportunity right now. Mr. Bansali, would you agree with that? We are enjoying the advantage of a governance premium? Uh, indeed. I think uh, particularly after the UP election, people thought that there will be this uniform cloud, etc. Uh, but I can also tell you that uh, the role of technology in enforcing uh, governance is not small. Uh, mm. I think this whole digitalization, uh, people may not be uh, seeing it as happening but I see every future plan now not based on cash, but on digitalization. And what that did, it just mm. enforces transparency. And uh, the, the aspiration, education, so I work with a few NGOs, and then what the, the kind of aspiration that you're seeing in the villages. So when, when a, a villager yeah. comes out as a consumer, he's not a villager, he's a consumer. So I think this whole consumer mm. phenomenon will also add to the governance. So good prime minister and a good governance along with all these processes are going to create a very, very powerful uh, uh, factor called governance. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, let me also very quickly give a snapshot of the key macroeconomic indicators over the last three years. Let's take a look at the GDP growth rate uh, between 
2014, what the situation was July, September 2014 at 8.4%, October to December 2016, 7%. Remember, this is also when we saw the demonetization impact uh, coming in. So that's been the situation as far as GDP growth is concerned, coming in at about 7%. Retail inflation, this is the big milestone the government has been able to achieve, whopping 8.3% in May of 2014, and it's been brought down to under 3% if you look at the numbers for April of 2017. So the war and the battle against inflation has been won by the Modi government. Let's then take a look at uh, what the local circle poll shows us. Because as you just saw there, inflation has actually come down. But if you take a look at what people are saying, 55% uh, last year didn't feel that prices of essential commodities had eased. And that number has actually gone up to about 66% this year. But this may in fact be uh, a measure of inflationary expectation because in actuality you actually have have seen uh, the inflation number coming off quite significantly. This is the big problem that the government is going to have to grapple with and that is the bad loan menace. Look at the number for June of 2014 at 2.3 lakh crore rupees and if you take a look at what Capital Online Plus has put down in terms of an aggregation of 26 public sector banks, the number has jumped to 6.4 lakh crores. This is the number now for December of 2016. So over three years it's gone from 2.3 lakh crores to 6.4 lakh crores. This is going to be the big challenge that the government has to deal with and grapple with. Let's talk about the challenge and that is the NPA challenge. There's been a lot of talk. We've seen that NPA ordinance go through. There's a crucial meeting that's being held even as we speak today to try and address and break this logjam. How confident do you feel about it Nilesh? And do you believe that the NPA stress is now more closer to being resolved? Well, that's a huge problem. The NPA problem, it's not a kind of a small number. Uh, that's, a, that's a significantly larger number. Uh, and I think, uh, it's, it's, I think a lot of steps have been taken. A lot of policy hurdles have been cleared. Uh, and there's definitely a lot more progress. So I think if you ask me, I mean, where we were three years back, uh, I think at three years back, I think the confidence levels were relatively lower. Uh, and I think three years back, I think the bigger challenge was the the uh, the restriction or the hesitation or the reluctance to recognize NPAs. And I think that itself has kind of uh, undergone a huge psychological cha uh, change. So today what we see is that there's a very clear-cut upfront recognition of NPAs. A lot of initiatives and steps mm. have been taken. And I think our sense is that probably over the next couple of years or maybe over the next two or three years, you would see a lot more progress because a lot of uh, legislative mm. changes have happened, a lot of otherwise operational changes have happened and I think these are some of the very positive steps which have been taken because of which I think we will be able to, to, to a large extent be able to kind of uh, resolve this problem. Of course it may not be possible to entirely resolve it in a very short time frame. Yeah. It's going to be a long mm. drawn and a long winding process but I think we are closer to that compared to where we were many years back. Ramdi Agarwal, would you agree that this is the number one problem and should be the number one priority of the government addressing the NPA problem? And do you feel confident that on the back of the measures that have been announced, we are perhaps closer to trying to start to ease the pain? <clears throat> Clearly, uh, this is a number one problem, uh, particularly if the economy has to take off. These are two-thirds of the banking system spread all over the country, particularly the uh, rural India. So, uh, I mean, how do, you, how do you fly when one of the engines, are, uh, one of the engines is not working? So, uh, but uh, the solution is, uh, this is the problem of money and money is lost and somebody has to pay for it. Now, uh, from where do you find and how do you find? Uh, it's going to be quite a tricky issue and I still don't see, mm. I mean, I can see the eagerness of the government, RBI, all that thought is put together mm. to solve this problem, but I still don't see uh, any constructive solution on the table. So okay. I think it will require... You don't see a constructive solution on the table? Uh, solution so I don't see. So what does that then yeah. mean as far as your... Uh, so then what does that mean then in terms of uh, your bet on the uh, public sector banking space, Ramdeo? Yeah, so I think that opens up opportunity for the private sector. That's why all the uh, BFSI, all the private sector banks, uh, NBFCs, housing finance companies, they are actually having party uh, at the cost of a uh, lot of these <laughs> public sector banks. So that has given actually a huge investment opportunity uh, to people like us. Yeah.
Hmm. Uh, let me get the industry's point of view on this. Pankaj Patel, uh, you know, I know that industry has been making representations to the government on trying to address this issue. This is as much a problem that's been created by industry, uh, not so much perhaps uh, necessarily by the government. A lot of it is also legacy issues, but as we know that the number has gone up over the last three years. Do you feel confident that we are now going to see some sort of constructive solution on the table on the back of what we've heard so far? So I think the uh, we as Fiki had recommended to government saying that there are three kind of uh, NPAs. One of the N one kind of NPA is where the, where the promoters are at fault. The second is because of policy paralysis, the promoters are unable to get permission, and that's why the projects have been delayed. And the third is the, where uh, the uh, Environment has changed and the, the technology has changed and that's why there are issues or some external factors are affecting. I think the NPA should be clarified, divided into these three uh, different buckets and they should be handled according to that. So our recommendation is that if there is a promoter at fault, the strict action should be taken. If there are delays because happen because of the policy, uh, delay, uh, permission not being granted, etc., then there should be a restructuring uh, process should be worked on. And if there are uh, environment is completely changed, then obviously we need to look at how do we liquidate that business and move forward. I think this NPA is there and I think there is somebody has to take a bold decision to move forward and take a final decision. I believe this government has uh, capability and have shown enough uh, ability where they are able to take some very bold decisions. And I'm sure in next few months we will see this government also addressing this issue very decisively. Okay, let's also take a look at some of the other data now and it's, uh, it's been a good uh, track record as far as the FDI flows are concerned which have come in at record highs. So in the first three years of the UPA government we saw $117 billion coming in in terms of foreign direct investment and the NDA the first three years $149 billion. So very strong performance there as far as foreign direct investment is concerned. But here's the worry. Gross fixed capital formation. July, September 2014, the number was at 30% of GDP. We've actually Actually fallen. So October to December 2017, gross capital formation down now to 26.7% of GDP. So as I pointed out, this is going to be uh, a challenge. This is a cause for concern uh, for the government. Let me bring Rakesh Bharti Mittal into this conversation as well before I tell you about the new project announcements. Under UPA 1, for the five years, that was the number. UPA 2, the number came down to about 322 billion. For the NDA in the first three years, new project announcements totaling to about 408 billion dollars there's one more interesting statistic that we want to leave you with this is all of course sourced from the center for uh, monitoring indian economy the cmie uh, new project announcements under the modi government year one 157 billion dollars year two 126 billion dollars and year three at 125 billion dollars but projects yet to be implemented UPA 2, 45% in the last three years of the UPA 2, and in the NDA, the first three years, 45% of the projects yet to be implemented. So this, again, is a crucial challenge for the government. Nilesh, let me start by asking you, uh, you know, on the gross capital formation side, we've actually seen a reduction from 30% to down to about 26-odd percent. Uh, new project investments, while the number looks better, uh, you know, the the absolute number in terms of the implementation is a cause for concern today. Uh, there was policy paralysis, policy logjam, uh, environmental clearances were a challenge. I think versus that, I think a lot of those softer issues have been addressed. But I think the big target that we need to really have is the spending on infrastructure. Uh, a country like China, even on this size, spends about 7% of its GDP on infrastructure every year versus that we are still at 5% on a smaller base. And I think that's an important gap to fill. There are some sectors like roads, for example, or renewable energy, uh, I think where a lot of progress has happened. Uh, oil and gas, hydrocarbons is where you're seeing early signs of investments picking up. But I think apart from that, a whole host of other areas on the infrastructure side is where a lot of momentum needs to pick up. And hopefully that would be the priority of the government over the next few years. So I think clearly this important uh, variable, which is basically the investment on infrastructure as a percent of GDP, needs to move up from this 4-5% levels to about 7%. And I think mm. given the, the macros and given the strong balance sheet that we currently mm. have, I think it's quite possible to do that, especially given that a lot of road has been crossed in terms of the policy side. Yeah. Ramdeo, how confident?
to you. Would you feel uh, of the hypothesis that Nilesh just laid out in terms of infrastructure spending moving beyond this 4 to 5 percent of GDP and moving quite uh, higher significantly? It looks that uh, environment is uh, better environment is created for the execution. So I look at like Mumbai. So in Mumbai we have uh, we are waiting for three four large projects. Of course this uh, uh, underground metro has started, but uh, a new airport, uh, Trans Harbour Bridge, and uh, uh, so these are the projects which are uh, and the coastal road. So all these projects are now almost at the verge of starting, but yet they are not started. They are long pending. I mean for decades they have been pending. And uh, for some uh, some policy issues or per permissions or clearances, they have not happened. So this is the uh, this is the this is the way things are. But hopefully by end of this year, all the three projects would be off the ground. So I think uh, it's like a marriage where there is a preparation for a big barat. So all the things are being collected, but yet barat is not out. So my sense is that uh, it's just about getting ready, and uh, maybe the market is saying that the the uh, big day or you know the uh, the start of the procession is going to be maybe 6 months away or 3 months away or maybe it has started huh. but that's the kind of situation so you're saying right the now. barat will take another 6 months to get to its destination i don't know you? no no not destination just to start <laughs> destination is going to be 10 years i think 7 eight, this is going to be a very big rally in the sense that i think this uh, 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 the new pm the new uh, dispensation in the uh, political uh, in the politics i think it looks to be a pretty big one and it will be very long. I mean, it looks to be 7, 8 years kind of a possibility, but how big it will happen and when will it start this CapEx thing? And that is that is what exactly mm. is the gap. And uh, uh, I think when you look at, see, when you look at cement demand, because nothing happens beyond cement, and cement demand is mm. still very slack. And uh, yeah, so, slack, yeah. so when it starts happening, maybe it is six months away. I mean, we are just hoping it will happen. And I think conditions are being created for that. Okay, conditions being created for that. Shailesh Kumar of the Euro Asia Group also joins us. Shailesh, many thanks for joining us. As uh, you assess the performance of the Modi government over the past three years, we were talking about the macroeconomic stability, uh, talking about the market enthusiasm, the reform intent, as well as the reforms that have been carried out. What, to your mind, would be the biggest achievement, the most significant milestones? Uh, hi, Shireen. Thanks for having me. I think what I'm about to say may have been already repeated, but I think the most, there's a couple of important indicators that uh, we've been observing, and I think most market participants have been uh, looking forward to. So the goods and services tax is the most obvious. Uh, this is not an easy lift, but they were, able to, uh, they were able to have it approved. And the efficiency with which it seems to be coming out in terms of implementation is really quite astonishing. There's going to be a lot of long-term implications, and I think one of which, uh, which is not fully appreciated, is the fact that a large chunk of the informal economy in India will become formalized uh, by virtue of this law. Yeah. And um, that's something that I think a lot of leaders have grappled with and no one's ever been able to properly solve. So GST is going to go a long mm -hmm. way in solving that. Bankruptcy law is critically important. It's something that India really didn't have, and this administration was able to push it through. Uh, the subsidy reform, yeah. direct benefit transfers, is important mm -hmm. for the fiscal health. I'd also point to the RBI Amendment Act of 2016, uh, that gave the yes. RBI an inflation mandate. It gave the MPC, the rise of the MPC. I mean, these are all critically important. And, and one, one really mm. important signal that I think um, needs to be focused on is is infrastructure. And the the fact that the last yeah. budget it, it, they allocated more money for infrastructure than they did for defense is a very subtle but important mm. signal that they're sending out to the investor community that things are different. And I think the sentimental change that's happening, the t shift in tone. The willingness to accept yeah. foreign investments and courting it. I mean, these are all very important drivers for, for the health of the economy. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you've listed out a bunch of things that have happened uh, uh, and have been taken forward by the government, both as far as executive action is concerned, as well as the legislative agenda. Gentlemen, we are going to have to take a quick break, but when we return, we address the big challenge facing the Modi government, and that is job creation. That and more when we return on The Verdict, the other side. हो रहा है तो क्या हो रहा है कैसे हो रहा है किसके लिए हो रहा है सब कुछ एक ठहराव सा महसूस होता था आज प्रति पल ठहराव से निकल करके एक निरंतर अविरत प्रवाह 
हर दिन नए कार्यक्रम हर दिन नई योजना हर दिन नया प्रयास हर दिन नई कोशिश देश अनुभव कर रहा है well, that is the Prime Minister speaking in Guwahati talking about the change in uh, governance, talking about the change in attitude from as the Prime Minister was pointing out from a situation of policy paralysis to a situation where every day there is a new scheme, a new yojana as he called it. But has the centre delivered on its promise of job creation? If you take a look at the poll conducted by local circles, it shows that 63% feel that the unemployment rate has not come down. This is against 43% who felt the same way during the second year anniversary of the Modi government. That's the local circles poll. But let's take a look at the Labour Department's data. It seems to support that sentiment. In the first year, 4.21 lakh new jobs were created. There was a sharp drop in the second year to just over 1 lakh jobs. And in the third year, it has improved to 3 lakh jobs. All of this is still a fraction of the kind of jobs that India needs to create. But there could be a stark contrast because if you take a look at what industry body CII is claiming, it claims that 37 lakh jobs have actually been created every year for the last four years. And this clearly is in contrast with the center's own data. Now, in a bid to address this, the center has set up a task force under the Niti Aayog Vice Chairman Arvind Panagaria to evolve a new method of calculating jobs data in India. So that, of course, is going to be the big priority as well as the big challenge. But let me go back across to our guests. Rakesh Bharti Mittal, you know, it's the CII data that's causing a lot of eyebrows to turn because the CII claims that actually 37 lakh new jobs have been added every year in the past three years and that is in stark contrast to the government's own data from the Labour Department. Um, yes, Shireen, uh, you know, we have to see this in the perspective of organised and unorganised uh, sectors both. And, and that's where clearly uh, CII's uh, position is that 3.7 billion jobs have been created uh, for the last uh, two years, year-on-year -year basis. And, 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 and we believe that now with the sentiment improving, this number will only go up. Shailesh, let me come back to you and let's talk about India and its engagement with the rest of the world. In terms of FDI, the number continues to be very, very robust, uh, record flows. But in terms of trade, uh, you know, whether it's the FTA with uh, the EU or it's the FTA with Australia or it's the bilateral investment treaty, on the trade front, things seem to have slowed down considerably or at least have not moved significantly further. Uh, would you, uh, how would you assess the performance on the trade front? So I think on the trade front, as you noted, things have been a bit of a disappointment. The sense I've, I've gotten is that this administration, um, maybe I'm assuming a little too much here, but the trade aspect doesn't seem to be as much of a priority. Investment is a far greater priority, which is why when the prime minister traveled, he talked far more about investment, talked about a macro-stable environment. Everything they've been doing in terms of reforms or in terms of engagement has been primarily focused on courting investments, less so on trade. And, and you're seeing this again with the bilateral investment treaties. A lot of them have been canceled. A lot of them are being reworked. It doesn't really seem like there's a lot of promise in terms of how the negotiations mm. and engagements are going. So I'm not, I don't think, I think this is a little bit of a disappointment, but I don't think it's accidental. I think it may be a little bit by design. Um, furthermore, engagement, Design, okay. though, there seems to be yeah, there seems to be a broader push for uh, for developing symbiotic relationships. And what I mean by this, if you see the, the government's engagement with with the U.S., for example, it, it's primarily focused on on defense, security, and investment. Those are the three areas. And mm. if the, if India can develop a partnership of sorts where there's greater cooperation on defense, but there's greater linkages between the yes. U.S. investor community and the Indian economy. And by virtue of that, you're going to have a situation over the long run where America and India just need each other, and they're going to work together. And I don't think trade necessarily is, is as critical for the Indian side in this context, and I don't think they're looking at it in that way. Okay, so it may not be a priority and a deliberate, uh, uh, deliberately uh, by design, uh, that's uh, Shailesh's point of view. But gentlemen, let me uh, come to the last question and issue that I want to touch upon. And the promise of uh, maximum governance and minimum government, uh, do you believe that it has really played out like that? There are concerns on whether we're harking back to an era of more price controls, for instance. There has been forward movement uh, in terms of legislative action, at least in some areas. But do you believe that this... Uh, that the promise of maximum government, uh, governance and minimum government has actually borne fruit. Uh, Pankaj Patel, let me start by asking you. 
So if we see from a uh, GST regulations, the way they've been uh, uh, done it, it basically going into a way where there is going to be maximum governance and minimum government. Uh, that's what they're moving towards. But I think in other areas, we still have not made enough progress. So I think ease of doing business, mm. we have done phase one. I think it's time for um, now to move into phase two where we need to now do far-reaching changes into the uh, that area which can help uh, so something, a lot has been done on the foreign direct investment. I think we need to really look at what else we can do uh, on Indian investment and Indian companies uh, okay. um, uh, entering the new projects, uh, etc. So that's going to be very important. Okay. I think, uh, Shirin, one point which I just uh, thought I would uh, touch here uh, uh, based on uh, your earlier discussion also is that the government uh, policy-driven initiative have seen a major change happening. For example, the whole energy sector has completely transformed into a different thing. And I'm seeing that like for account, mm. apart from that, if you see some changes they did in budgeting process, the uh, releasing yeah. the fund earlier, all these are actually enhancing yeah. the implementation phase. So I clearly see that you mm. will see the results of that. Now you, you see the economy is a behemoth and when it is going gone down, to bring it back to again in a speed, it requires a lot of effort and, and we need to have patience and time to yeah. really move, see the impact of that being seen. But I am clearly okay. seeing that these impacts are now being visible and we will see much more. Okay, phase two of the ease of doing business, that is the need of the hour now. Rakesh Bharti Mittal, that's the view coming in uh, from your colleague at Fiki. Um, I, I fully um, endorse that, uh, Shireen. As a matter of fact, I think there is lot of work which has been done on the ease of doing business. Uh, uh, internationally, globally, India has uh, moved up the rankings. But I think more importantly, the most innovative thing which has been done is bringing the states into competing with each other on ease of doing business. And, and, and if you see actually, uh, you know, the, the insolvency and bankruptcy uh, uh, code, the Real Estate Regulation Act, I mean, there are many things which have been done, including uh, doing away with th more than 1,000 obsolete uh, laws, rules, and regulations are clearly bringing a uh, lot of transparency into the system, um, uh, uh, auctioning the natural resources in a very transparent manner. I think these are the areas which also is ensuring that there is a lot of uh, investment which is coming uh, from globally mm. and will now start rolling out within India. And, and, and uh, just one point I want to add here, uh, uh, I mean, uh, on, on the capital formation, you know, I, the, the audio was not clear. But my belief is on short to medium term, I think the private sector needs to be brought in to play a larger role in agriculture and food processing mm. because that is one area okay. where capital formation has not happened and, and the private sector can bring it in. While on the long term perspective, there are many government uh, schemes including uh, reforming the railways, the Odan scheme, you know, building new, new uh, uh, airports, uh, 40 new airports, on and so forth. Mm. So, so I think all in all, I can say that uh, uh, we see a much more positive uh, way forward uh, 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 in, the, in the economy uh, and uh, almost okay. all the sectors. All right, so let me end then by asking you uh, what your number one ask would be. Nilesha, uh, you know, we're all talking about uh, positive mood, buoyancy, enthusiasm, structural reform, structural changes, transformative changes. Given this context, what would your number one ask be of the government? Well, I think clearly it should be that focus on infrastructure. I think clearly that should be the biggest, biggest focus. It's now really time to kind of, you know, uh, up the game there, increase significant investments there, because I think we have done all the softer issues of GST and all of that. Now I think if you have infrastructure mm. in place, that will make Indian manufacturing a lot more competitive and that will create jobs. And I think mm. all of this will benefit every citizen of the country. Okay, so Ramdeo Agarwal, we're in the midst of the mother of all bull runs and you believe that the mother of all bull runs is here to stay for the next several years. Yes. So, uh, I think one of the things, uh, one of the great opportunities uh, this government has, which is so dynamic uh, in uh, taking bold decisions. I think uh, uh, we are $2 trillion economy with more than $600 billion of savings every year. And, uh, I mean, are we harnessing that, uh, the, all the savings? Yes, it is being talked about in RBI reports and various places. I think we need a maybe central minister called Minister of Savings. And uh, I mean, if you use $600 billion cohesively and in a right way, I think mm. there is enough money 
to build uh, infrastructure as well as uh, uh, in private sector whatever housing and everything else we need. But do we, are yeah. we actually using our savings properly? Hmm. Well, that, that is going to be the question that the government will hopefully address uh, in its pending tenure, at least uh, under NDA 2. And let's see what happens post-2019. But Ramdeo Agarwal, Nilesh Shah, Rakesh Bharti Mittal, Valla Bansali, Shailesh Kumar, Pankaj Patel, appreciate you joining us here on this CNBC TV 18 special discussion as we decode the impact and the implications of the actions of the government over the past three years. Do stay on with us here on CNBC TV 18 as we bring you lots more special analysis and comprehensive coverage.